everybody. My name is Joy Martin. Hello, everybody. My name is Anita Jefferson. And hey, everyone. I'm Terry Roberts, and uh, we make up the spiritual development team at Intentional Faith, which is a nonprofit organization here in Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, we're just very blessed again today to to come and share uh, share, share some scripture with you. We've been focusing on uh, after Easter. We've fo focused on uh, how do we live in the resurrection after we uh, celebrated Jesus' resurrection. And we've been doing this by looking at several accounts of uh, Jesus appearing uh, prior to his ascension. So we're kind of culminating that today because we are going to focus on uh, one of the accounts of Jesus' ascension from the book of Acts. But uh, before we dig into his word today, uh, Miss Anita, would you open us with prayer? Absolutely. Thank you, Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we love you. We thank you because of your love, the love that you have for your people, the love that you have for your creation. Father, we thank you. And that's just what we want to say in this prayer is thank you for all is well. All is well, not going to be, but it is already. We thank you for this session and thank you for the set. We thank you. Father, for intentional faith, now speak through us as we elaborate on who you, on what you want us to say. Help us now, Father, these blessings we do ask in the name of Jesus, we do pray. Thank you and amen. Amen. Thank you, Miss Anita. And Joy, would you read our scripture for us? I would love to. Yay. So we're in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, in case you want to follow along, but we love reading scripture out loud. So I'll start in verse 6. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. God bless the reading and hearing of his word there. So as I mentioned earlier, over the past several weeks, we, we've looked at these appearances of Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually, I think, 13 recorded appearances of Jesus. Uh, 11 of those would have been prior to his ascension. This would be the 12th. And then when he appears to Paul on the road to Damascus is the 13th. And uh, so we've been looking at several of those and looking at them in the light of what that means for us today is we too are trying to live, you know, in the resurrection of Jesus. And, you know, today we're looking at this story of his ascension. And uh, it's this one is in this account is in Acts chapter 1, and you can also find this if you want to read the other accounts in Mark uh, chapter 16 verses 19 and 20, and also in Luke 24, 50 through 53. Um, this scripture also includes, and I think that's kind of why we went to this particular one, it, it, it includes a version of the Great Commission, which can also be found in, in Matthew 28, you know, where Jesus promises his disciples that they're going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit so that they then can go share the gospel to the world. But then one other very interesting note, I think, in this scripture is the reference of the, the two men dressed in white, which I'm assuming are probably angels that are coming to tell the disciples, you know, that, you know, Jesus has ascended into heaven, but they're making that point that one day he is going to return, and I think it's just very interesting that he's going to return in the same way to the same spot, which we know is on the Mount of Olives. So, um, so we're going to look at 
several aspects of this story, again, in the light of how it applies to us as we live in the, re in, in the resurrection. So, uh, Miss Anita, I guess the qu first question is coming to you. Uh, since you chose this one, you wanted this one, so I'm going to let you have this one. Uh, so what do you think is this, the significance for us today of receiving this power of the Holy Spirit as we live in the resurrection of Jesus? As we live in the resurrection of Jesus. I'm going to try not to elaborate on my own uh, uh, mess, uh, sense because we ain't got no sense since the Holy Ghost is is our sense now. So I'm going to try good. to, <laughs> I'm going to try to do this based on my study. Uh, living in light of the resurrection, it means that we have a purpose and it also means that we have a future toward hope. H-O-P-E. And I underline that word, hope is the key word here. So when Jesus rose again, he brought God's plan into his fruition. The resurrection is the completion of Jesus's life on earth. And it is also the forerunner to his second coming. I like the word hope because that's what the resurrection is. The resurrection is our hope. We live in the light of that resurrection, which is to say we live in the hope of being resurrected. Mm -hmm. I like that. We live in the hope of being resurrected like he was or like he did. Uh, hope, uh, you know, and, and that's a word that we, uh, a lot of us, uh, even Christians, allow to confuse them. And I'm getting to the question. I'm getting to the <laughs> question. Hope is defined, uh, according to our dictionary, as a feeling of, ex of expectations and desire for a certain thing to happen. Like for instance, uh, I hope it stopped raining. Uh, I hope that uh, we don't experience the storm that the weatherman said. I hope that uh, our travel is safe, and I hope we're going to do this, and I hope we're going to do that. I hope, I hope you like me. However, biblical hope, which is a real hope, is different. It is something, biblical hope is certain and promised to be fulfilled. It's a sure thing, and that's how we live. We know because it's a sure thing, the resurrection. It is not unwavering, nor can it be changed. The resurrection means that what is to come, it outweighs the here and the now. Mm -hmm. I like that too. Um, now, I see the resurrection when I think of it. And, 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 yeah, I'm getting to the question. I'm getting to the question. The resurrection, to me, has two purposes, or two functions, rather. It's the way I see it. Now, this is me. I'm just saying this. It has two functions, the word resurrection. It has, in, number one, the resurrection, which is Jesus, has enabled us to be born again, which is that born again or that new birth is the resurrection from damnation, to a new life of salvation. Mm -hmm. The resurrection is also the hope that he gives us to know that after our physical death, we will live again in paradise. So to me, that seems like two functions of the resurrection. Uh, my question, in light of this resurrection, then what is the significance of receiving the Holy Spirit? which Jesus told his disciples, his disciples before he ascended up into heaven. Uh, and when I look at the scripture from Joy was reading, I picked out, of course, Acts 1 and 8, but ye shall receive power. Now, the question is, what is the significance of the Holy Spirit? The, <laughs> according to 1 and 8, the number one significance of the Holy Spirit is to receive power. So the question is, why? Why do we need power to receive it for what? Receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And I say again, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall receive power after... <laughs> 
the Holy Ghost has come upon you. A lot of people is performing Christianity without the power, mm. which is impossible. We can't, you're performing, mm -hmm. but it's without the power. We cannot do a please rather what God, how he wants us to live our life without the power that he's given us to live it with. So I'm not going to get, I'm not going to, uh, Joy is going to talk about the commission, uh, which is the reason why they needed their power. Uh, so we know that, uh, and, and this is another part of what I study. Jesus was speaking to the, uh, uh, the apostles. So uh, he gave them a mission of spreading the gospel, which was the, and, and this, this article says it was the major reason. The power to spread the gospel is the major reason. So then uh, we'll get that question later. Uh, but in verse eight, why we need to receive the power from God? Why do we need this power? It's not for our own use so that we could brag uh, to someone else. Of course, we can't brag about this power anyway. We brag about, if, we, if we're bragging about any power, we're bragging about some power we're exercising on our own and it ain't good. It ain't strong enough. It is to make our witness of Jesus more powerful. We can see here that the message of the gospel is not just for Israel, but it's for all nations. So what I did is I listed, Terry, uh, the uh, significance of this power. Uh, number one, as we've already said, is to receive power. Now, the apostles had already experienced the Holy Spirit saving guiding, teaching, miracle working power. But soon later, after that, after soon later, they would also receive his indwelling presence and a new dimension of that power to witness. Indwelling presence in a new dimension, not the same, but a new dimension. This is Ephesians 3, 1 and 6. Paul prays for his son. Well, in Ephesians, the third chapter of Ephesians, verses 16 through 20, Paul is praying for the Gentiles. And in that prayer, he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being <laughs> so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And verse 19 says, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. As I was reading that prayer, I underlined some words. I, sh I highlighted words like power, inner being, love, power again, uh, love again, love, <laughs> see love is used in that same path. And then I, under I highlighted field and I also highlighted fullness. Those are the words that are to me significant. And then uh, another significance of this power is that it gives us victory over sin, as explained in Romans 8, 11 through 17. Paul shows us another significance of the resurrection. He has, uh, he's already reminded us of the struggle and the temptations that we're going to experience uh, on our own. So the answer to this, these temptations is not to try harder, but to rely on the resurrection power. The Holy Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. And I hear so many of us saying, I'm trying, I'm trying. And I've said this before, I am trying. And that's a problem because you're trying. You're trying and you're going to spend the rest of your life trying and never accomplishing what the power has already given you the strength to accomplish. Mm -hmm. I, I'm so, I'm trying. 
I'm trying to be a Christian. I'm trying. Excuse me. Stop trying and allow the Holy Spirit. Our minds, our emotions, it's not power. We have to allow the Holy Spirit that lives in us. I said I wasn't going to be dogmatic. Okay. The power enables us to say no. Now, I've caught myself saying this so many times, but here again, the uh, uh, instructions that I'm reading or this lesson that I'm reading came off of a, uh, uh, I want to say Billy Graham. It was a Billy Graham's page. He said, the power, he, he said, Billy Graham said, the power enables us to say no to sin. We don't do it, but it enables us to do it. It enables us not only to say no to sin, but it frees us from fear. Ooh, I'm scared. And it also gives us an inner testimony to the fact that we are God's children and co-heirs with him. Now, that actually completed. I have a question. I'm going to ask uh, uh, Joy. But so we talk about this power that the Holy Spirit is all this power. So uh, there's a few more reasons for the power once we're saved and we belong to god the spirit takes up resident this power this spirit takes up residence in our hearts forever sealing us with the confirming certification and assurance of our hope in christ so the hope the power of the holy spirit is also a revealer of truth the significance of the Holy Spirit is also the one that gives gifts as mentioned in the 12th chapter of Corinthians. All those gifts that you find is because of the power that lives in us. Uh, there again, people are, people are trying to exercise these gifts without the power. They come from the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm saying power. Yes, it is power, but it comes from the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what produces those gifts. Uh, the Spirit also functions as a fruit producer. Without the function of the Holy Spirit, there is no love. Without the function of the Holy Spirit, there is no joy. There is no peace. And there is no patience. I can attest to that. The, and, and all of the other gifts that's mentioned in Galatians 5. The knowledge that the Holy Spirit of God has taken up residence in our lives. He performs all these miraculous functions that we cannot perform on our own. He dwells with us forever. And that he will never leave or forsake us. It causes great joy and comfort. And we thank God for this precious gift, the Holy Spirit and his work. Now, if I was saying this in church before a congregation, I'd be shouting by now. <laughs> That's good. I, I mean, I'm excited. So listen, I, I got another question here then. Miss Joy, Miss Joy, what does it mean? that we are called to be witnesses of Jesus to the world? Hey, sister, I'll shout for you. I'll yeah. shout. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm all over that. That was very, very good. Okay, so a great segue into what you talked about, Anita. You talked about, you know, uh, the resurrection enables mm -hmm. us to be born again. Um, Holy Spirit enables us to be born again. Um, and that the power of the Holy Spirit living within us, not our own. You talked about the hope. And this is the thing right here <laughs> that the Spirit took me to, right as you were saying that. In 1 Peter 3, verse 15, it says, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope, as a believer, always be ready to explain it, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. So in pulling that together, first of all, we don't even come to Jesus without the power of the Holy Spirit opening our eyes, opening our understanding, drawing us. And then there's this part that we say yes 
to the Father. But um, I got to take you to places in the New Testament when Jesus was walking here on earth and he was meeting people in person where they were. For instance, the woman at the well. And I love, love, love that story. Here's a woman that everybody else said she is like, you know, from the wrong side of the tracks and um, she's not with us upper class spiritual followers. She's not doing good. And Jesus chose to meet her first in her city and tell her the good news. The salvation had come to her that the father um, loved her and that she could be part of the, the true family of God. And you know what she did? First thing she did, she ran and told everybody else about it. Okay, it's like if I find that um, the best shoes in the world are on sale for $5 and they're normally a $100 pair of shoes, I'm gonna be calling all my friends. I'm gonna be putting it on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, everything I can do to say, you gotta come over here and get these shoes because they're not gonna last long. There's these shoes over here. They're $100 pair of shoes at $5. And this is the excitement though, that after she was with Jesus and encountered him personally, she went running to tell everybody she knew of this amazing man, God in flesh that she had met. And it seems like there are other situations too where Jesus met with people. And it seems like when people truly encountered the person and presence of Jesus Christ, they couldn't help it, but they had to go like tell other people. And I love, um, you know, some of us watch um, The Chosen. And if you haven't ever seen that, please download the app. It is one of the best depictions to me of Jesus and the disciples and all that that I have ever, ever seen. Um, but I love that one of the taglines they use in season two is come and see, come and see. And this, this is what the, the woman at the well, she, she would run, she would come and see, come and see this man that told me everything that I've ever done. And he knows all about me. And, and he told me all this stuff. And, and she just, you know, it's not like she told him everything that he told her. She just said, come and see, come and see. And she took them to Jesus so that they could hear from him personally and put their faith in him. So here's the thing about being a believer. Um, and this is, this is something that's just been going on and on with me. Um, there's no hoarding in the kingdom of God. Okay. <laughs> so when you, there's a theme that runs throughout scripture that when you've been given much, much is required. Um, when you, in second Corinthians one, it talks about when we've been given comfort, we're to turn around and comfort others with the comfort that we've received. Um, it's not just that we have received this amazing uh, Holy Spirit and, and that we're now in the family of God. It is not for us to just hoard that to ourselves. There's no hoarding allowed in the kingdom of God. It's always about enjoying it and embracing it ourselves but sharing it with others and saying, come and see, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Um, even in, um, we've done the Beatitudes before in Matthew chapter five, we're called to be light bearers, to be salt and light in the earth, you know? So it's like, we've been given the light of Jesus Christ, the truth, the life and the way, and that makes us light bearers. And we're to carry that torch and that light to as many people as we can. Um, and even Terry mentioned that this is another part of the Great Commission, which says, go and make disciples. Don't sit on your can and just enjoy your own salvation. Never. That's not the way it's ever supposed to be. We're supposed to go and make disciples, tell other people 
there's another story that one a couple other stories and then i'll move on but that pearl of great price in the new testament too and i heard a pastor um amos at our church the village church share this on sunday that 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 jesus told this parable about this pearl of great price and this man when he found that pearl you know he went he sold everything he had so that he could buy that okay but um he Amos, uh, Pastor Amos um, mentioned this, that when you find that pearl of great price, it's supposed to be shared with others. That news, that great gift is always supposed, to, your treasure, you're supposed to always share your treasure. Um, and Jesus says, be fishers of men. You know, and it seems like, it seems like to me, um, I'm not maybe the smartest one in the pile, but it seems to me that the natural response of someone whose life had been changed was to share that with as many people as possible. I'm so excited, I can't tell you. I mean, people do that with diets, people do that with, you know, sale, retail sale, people do that with, you know, I found the best food price or the best restaurants. Wouldn't this mean so much more? I mean, to have true peace and life and deep contentment and joy that can only be found in putting our trust and faith in Jesus Christ and knowing that we have peace for the future, that, that eternity starts now, but we're locked in. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. that Anita talked about, and that can never be taken away from us. So wouldn't it be a natural response for people who had truly been gripped by the message of Jesus Christ that you can't help but share it with others. That's right. I mean, that that's just to me a thought I keep pondering, like, wouldn't it just make sense that that would be natural? So, and as Jesus would have it, he called us to be the fragrance of Jesus Christ to the world. He says that in another passage, you know, you're, you're my fragrance. Everywhere you go, you should almost like smell like me to where people are like, what's up with you? You know, and the even the essence of us just should be some kind of illumination of the image and presence and power of the Holy Spirit living within us. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a big deal to me. And I, I love that. And for whatever reason, Jesus has chosen us to be that. He could have sent another, I don't know, PR guy, but he said, no, you, you're my witnesses. You're my witnesses in all of the earth, not just here. So start where you are in your own home, in your own neighborhood. Tell somebody about the hope that is within you. Um, that's the best way. You don't have to worry about having all the four spiritual laws down and the Romans road and you don't have to worry about that just tell them what God's done in your life just say mm -hmm. man I met a man and I can't stop talking about him I mean he's just the best thing that's ever happened to me you don't have to worry that you have all the scripture passages right that you got all the formulas honestly what is the better message is for you to tell them how Jesus has changed your life so do that today mm -hmm. go ask God to give you somebody to share that with today. But Terry, tell us some more. What does it mean for us living in the resurrection to wait, to wait? We're waiting and waiting on Jesus to return one day. That's the part that hasn't happened yet. So tell us what all that means. Well, I love how this links together and I'll hopefully piece some of that together as I'm sharing this. But I, I had to share this because it's kind of funny. So, um, you know, a lot of times we um, want to look at a definition of a word. I'm, I'm bad about that. Anita loves to do that, too, to give the definition of word. So I went and looked up the uh, Webster definition for the word weight. And this is a classic example of where we've got to look at this eternally and not earthly, because <laughs> the definition of the word weight says to stay where one is or delay action until a particular time or until something else happens. Wow. I'm telling you right now, 
That's <laughs> not what we're supposed to do <laughs> while we're waiting. If we're living in the resurrection, it doesn't mean that we stay where we are and do nothing as we wait on Jesus return. So that was just kind of funny as I was thinking about things this morning, but where this took me, and it was actually several of Jesus parables are mm -hmm. focusing on the end times. And so I sort of went to those and I'm going to reference several of those in what we should do as we are waiting. Um, very interesting note that these parables were primarily told on the Mount of Olives, where Jesus ascended from and where he, where he will return again. So I just thought that was just an interesting note to, to mention there. Mm -hmm. So I think the first way that we live in the resurrection and wait on Jesus' return is in anticipation, being very excited and alert and watchful is a, is a good term. Um, there is a parable that's entitled the watchful servant. And I'm not going to read all of these parables, but I'll reference it's in Luke 12 verses 35 through 40. But there Jesus sort of makes this point about being watchful and anticipating and i'll read a couple of the verses it just says be dressed and ready for service and that kind of links into other things we need to be doing and keep your lamps burning i love there's a lot of reference to lamps and being the light of the world like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks you immediately open the door for him and it will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. So the first thing we need to be doing is being excited, anticipating, and waiting very watchfully for him to return. And uh, I know for a fact that these three people on the screen are in that place that we're excited and anticipating and watchful for Jesus coming. But I think that's kind of the first step for us. Um, the second thing that came to me was that we, we also have got to be ready <laughs> for, for Jesus return prepared, maybe, a, a, an even better word. And, and that quickly takes us to the parable of the 10 virgins that, uh, we've, I know we've talked about a lot recently. That's in Matthew 25 verses one through 13. And there Jesus is emphasizing that we need to have oil in our lamps. You know, there were five virgins who didn't have the extra oil, five virgins who had plenty of oil. And so that when the the bridegroom came, they were, were ready. They had oil in their lamps. So, and as I did a little research and just thought about what the lamp and the oil actually meant, the lamp is sort of our lives, our outward lives as we sort of show that love of Jesus, you know, to the world, that we let that light that he has put within us shine before men. And there's a reference there to Matthew 5, 16. But the oil, and this is tying us back to everything else that we've already talked about, especially the Holy Spirit there. The oil is, is God's grace that's in us, but more specifically, it is that gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. That yep without which our lamp is going to burn very, very dimly, and eventually it's going to expire and run out. Yes. So as we wait on Jesus' return, you know, we make sure we fill our lives with that oil, that power of the Holy Spirit, and then be that light into the world, you know, sharing the good news as Joy was talking about, the gospel of Jesus. And then finally, um, you know, as we live in the resurrection and, and we wait on, on Jesus' return, we've got to be about our Father's business. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've got to be doing what he has called us to do. Um, and I think the parable of the, the, the talents probably, ref, you know, references that the best. And that's in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Jesus reminds us there that we have, we have work to do in this season while we're waiting and when he returns he's going to expect us to have wisely used the the, the talents the resources the opportunities that he's given us um, and we we need to have used those 
to honor and glorify him and for his kingdom and his glory. So I think the, the things that we do as we wait is we got to be anticipating and watchful. Um, we've got to be ready, having our lives filled with that oil, with the, with the power of that Holy Spirit. And we need to be about our Father's business. We need to be doing the Lord's work that he has called. The purpose for which he has called us is how we both live in the resurrection, but also wait for Jesus to return. Mm -hmm. All right. So any, uh, y'all have any other thoughts y'all want to share before we wrap up today? A lot of good notes today. Thank you guys. Yeah. That was awesome. I'm, I'm happy all over again. <laughs> That's good. With, you know, the, in, you know, as I was thinking, we kind of mentioned yesterday. So just a little teaser for you guys for next week. We're going to start this study um, of, of the book of Daniel and especially focused on uh, a lot of the end time prophecies there and just an incredible segue here from this ascension story and how we live in the resurrection as we're anticipating you know Jesus return and now we're going to focus on uh, that prophecy that is foretelling of his return and we're going to be very blessed because a young man, uh, John Divin, who also works as a part of our team, is going to be leading us in this study. He's uh, He's been really, really drawn into the book of Daniel for a while, and I think he's been doing this study with with some other groups of people, but uh, he's agreed to, to, to do it for us and with us, and so uh, just kind of a teaser for you guys for next week. We'll start in a, in a study of the book of Daniel starting uh starting next week well all right well i hope everyone was blessed and uh, let's bow and i'll close this with a word of prayer and father god always our first thing when we uh just pause in your presence is uh, we just worship you father we we praise you lord because you are god uh, and we just thank you for all your blessings we thank you for your word and just the truth that it speaks into our lives and especially the truth that we receive as we are filled with that Holy Spirit. So, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will just fill our lives till we are overflowing so that we can be that light into the world, that we can do the things that you've revealed to us today that we need to be doing as we are waiting for your return. Father, fill us with your spirit. Help us to live out that great commission just to share the gospel and the love of Jesus with everyone we meet. And Lord, uh, we're not doing it for us, but Lord, we're just doing it to honor and glorify you to do what you have called us to do. So Father, we just pray that in Jesus' name and we can just say with confidence, yes and amen. Thanks everyone for joining us and we will uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. <laughs>